Well, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a, uh, this is a follow-up conversation with Jonathan Wellam. My name is Steve Strongathern with the Christian Embassy. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Steve. Good, good to be back, and uh, what, what a wonderful opportunity to answer some tremendous questions that people have. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So uh, for those of you who are just tuning in here, I encourage you to just check out the webinars that uh, the webinar that we have posted. We'll provide the link here for you as well first, uh, seeing as this is a follow-up conversation to Jonathan's uh, webinar that was titled Recession, Reflation, Restoration. Uh, Jonathan spoke to some of the economic challenges resulting from the public health response to COVID-19. We weren't able to get through all the questions that came in during the presentation itself. And so Jonathan has graciously agreed to just continue the conversation here. We'll have a conversation together. You can hear some of the questions that were brought forward during that webinar and then uh, be able to consider his response as well. So thanks so much, Jonathan, for taking this time uh, both for your thoughtful presentation and then also taking the time just to respond to these extra questions. During the presentation, one of the things that you made reference to was the idea of zombie industries and so uh, saying that they were being propped up actually. And so I was just wondering if the question here is, could you please give an example or two of a zombie industry that is being kept alive by government bailouts? Yeah, that's a it's a great question, and uh, it, it, when I did when I went through my presentation, quite a few of the lines were loaded with a lot of um, you know with terms, and then there was major issues behind just even some of the things I said. So this is this is an example of that. So when I'm referring to zombie corporations, not just ones that are the beneficiaries of bailouts. I mean, in Canada, probably the exhibit A, B, and C would be Bombardier. Um, that would be a wonderful example of one that, you know, is in cahoots with the uh, federal government and has been bailed out many times. But more generally speaking, if, and if the person that asked the question were to do a quick Google search on zombie companies, what you're going to find out is that this is a whole area of discussion within the world of finance. That's what's happened over the last few years is with interest rates being brought so low artificially, it, it doesn't um, bring the checks and balances into, into the organizations and the companies. So many companies can use debt because it's so cheap to keep their businesses going and they've got their balance sheets just laden with so much debt. And they can just, and again, they can survive longer than they normally would if they had to pay a higher cost for their money. So you can look at retailers. All sorts of retailers should have gone out of business a long time ago, but they borrowed a lot of money and they're kept alive with low interest rates. In the United States, you can look at the fracking industry and some of the oil and gas businesses uh, down there that have been propped up by low cost of money. That if the money was more competitive and they were paying market, you know, market rates without these manipulations by the central banks, they would have been they would have been long gone. So we're really talking about businesses that are living off of high indebtedness and really low interest rates. Um, and that's not a healthy thing in a capitalist system. What you need to have is a turnover of companies, you need companies to be competitive and need them to be strong, weak companies to disappear, and then they're, they're you know, taken over by stronger companies. So that's really the term zombie corporation, zombie businesses being propped up uh, by the low interest rates and sometimes by direct gov government um, support like the aerospace industry and you know there's all sorts of industries that have been supported by the government probably more than they should have. Mm -hmm. Some numbers in the show that in the United States the private or individual debt levels have dropped significantly since the 2008 crisis. Um, how does that play in light of the debt to, of the US government going in the opposite direction? Yeah it's a great question and what happens is you really if you're gonna look at a country you have to look at three levels of debt, the personal debt, corporate debt, and then the government or sovereign debt. And the, and the sovereign debt can be federal, uh, state, or in our case, it's provincial, and then municipal. And you really need to add all those layers up. The, the questionnaire, the person that asked the question, I should say, is, is exactly right. In the United States, the debt on personal, personal debt in the United States reached a peak back in about 08, 09. And then with the financial crisis there, a lot of it was because of uh, borrowings for homes, it actually came down and has been much lower than say the Canadian rate, which is one of the highest in the world. But what I would suggest is that that's great for the retail uh, person and that's, that's lovely, it's come down, but their government is more than made up for it 
and corporations have also more than made up for it. So when you look at the overall indebtedness of the country, it's at levels that is unsustainable. And the same thing when you look at the Canadian situation, although our personal level of debt in Canada is, is along with Australia, would be two of the highest in the world. So not only do we have a government problem, not only do you have corporations that have a lot of debt, Canadians are heavily indebted, um, again, to the tune of some of the worst in the world. Mm. So look at the whole, you have to look at the whole picture, but that's, that is a nuance that the uh, person asking the question is quite right about. Right, right. Uh, next few questions actually have to do with uh, some investment holdings, I imagine, for in people as they're thinking about, uh, uh, about next steps here. So the one here is about uh, gold. How much gold exposure do you recommend your clients own in their portfolios? It's a great question. And, and you know, typically, if you're really in a healthy economy and you trust the government policies and your money is sound, I would say 5 to 10% would be exposed to, say, precious metals types of investments, things that are a bit of a hedge. To be blunt, in this market, when we're seeing unlimited amount of, uh, you know, virtually unlimited amount of money printing and debts just exploding, um, I would I would be 15 to 20 percent in some of the precious metals area and making sure my other equity investments were in tangible businesses like real businesses infrastructure I mentioned a couple in the presentation but infrastructure businesses water businesses um, some of the technology companies that are essential you want to buy scarcity in businesses that are essential you you know the government can't print them and uh, you can't reproduce these businesses easily and, and society needs them. Those, those are the kind of assets you wanna own because they'll be able to readjust if there's heavy inflation, they'll be able to reprice and protect your purchasing power. So in terms of gold specifically, I'd be running 15 to 20%. And I don't mean just in miners, that can be in physical gold, it could be in miners, it could be in royalty companies. I mean broad exposure to that space. And I normally would not be suggesting that. And I don't want to be careful about giving investment advice on a, on a, a call like this. But um, you need to you know, sit down with the person and go through their, their personal financial situation. But these are extreme situations that we're facing. And um, right. our, money, our money value is under a lot of pressure. Right. I think I hear your, uh, your response to this already in, in what, you've, uh, what you've alluded to. Um, however, what's your view on the Canadian banks as an investment today? Yeah, we would be very cautious. Um, the Canadian banks are still much better in terms of their overall strength when you compare them to European banks, Chinese banks, uh, many banks around the world. But banks, their assets um, basically are our liabilities. And so with the Canadian you know, the Canadian economy is so much in debt and the Canadian in investor so highly indebted and with our real estate market being quite high and I think it's going to be weaker in going forward, then I would be very cautious about the Canadian banks. I think they have a rough ride ahead of them for the next couple of years. Now, that doesn't mean they'll, you know, they'll go and, you know, they'll tank or they'll drop precipitously. I think there's going to be a tough time for them to make money in the Canadian banks. Um, they, uh, it's going to be a rough ride. And so we just stay away from them. We even stay further away from the big life goals or companies that have made long-term promises and commitments to their policyholders, where in a financial crisis or when you've got a lot of pressure on interest rates, you know, as low as they are, it makes it more difficult for them to meet those obligations. So if people are thinking, they're thinking, okay, do I want to, if I have a debt problem, what businesses are exposed to that debt, number one? If, I'm, if there's going to be businesses that have made long-term promises in this environment, we don't know what it's going to look like five years from now, 10 years from now, what kind of restructuring we're going to have to go through. Why don't I just avoid some of those companies and just go to the sidelines, look for other more promising opportunities. So those are just some thoughts in terms of financials. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In terms of anything to, else to add as well, in terms of real estate, um, and uh, what, you, what you anticipate real estate is going to be looking like uh, in the current economic environment? Yeah, I mean, I think in the short run, short to medium term, so what do I mean? Six months to 18 months, you look at the Canadian real estate market, it's, I just can't, I cannot see anything but pressure on the downside. Um, so we'd be very cautious. Why do I say that? Because you've had, you're going to have bankruptcies. 
um, because of the uh, this uh, lockdown and people not um, you know buying from business. So you know lots of retail bankruptcies and other you know um, hospitality businesses, restaurants, and so forth. Those, they're going to bankruptcy, so that's going to be pressure on the market. A second, you've got uh, people have lost jobs, and so they're going to have a harder time paying their their mortgages. Third, you've got way too much debt, and some people have bought second, third, you know, condos and places to rent out. You've got pressure, you know, Airbnb's under pressure. You know, they're basically mm -hmm. shut down, and so they've just got a lot, a cascading number of issues, including immigration, which has been cut back because of, again, just being concerned about who's coming into the country, uh, do they run a risk with uh, you know, the coronavirus and so forth. If you put all of those together, it doesn't take much for the supply of homes and condos coming on the market to grow quickly and for the demand to be on the sidelines. And so all of a sudden you're gonna get a pricing imbalance. And so I would anticipate some pretty, pretty good weakness over the next little while. Um, and, uh, and before it stabilizes. And so if you're in the market to buy, it could be a great opportunity. If you need to sell, I think be patient and be careful. It could be a tough market to sell and realize good value. Um, is globalism as we have known it over the past two, two decades dead? I think there's a lot of pressure on that type of globalism that we just had, you know, we had, uh, uh, again, a lot of things moving to cheaper labor countries. Um, we had uh, second, third world countries really benefiting from a lot of the you know, global trade and a lot of those initiatives and so forth, open borders and so on. We're seeing a pushback because of some of the things I mentioned. Um, the supply chains are under a lot of pressure. We found out that if we just ship everything to faraway lands, if we actually need it, really in the short order or if these are essentials we can be very vulnerable and we've seen that through ppe the you know the medical supplies um, drug companies and so on so i think to a certain degree um it's it's woken up the world to the fact that trade is great but we need to make sure we're not vulnerable in that trade it's also opened up up i think more concerns about um, you know, stealing intellectual property and things like that. And obviously, President uh, Donald Trump's been dealing with that in terms of the United States and China. So I think there's going to be some pushback. And I think, I, ho I hope, hope uh, helpful pushback and that'll safeguard our economy. But I also, here's another side of me, which I don't, I don't want the globalism that we've seen in the last two decades. I think we should do trading, but we should also be protective of our core industries and, and nation states should be very strong also. So there's checks and balances, but there's a lot of forces that are more global in approach. And so I, I wonder whether there'll be a pullback, some readjustment, and then fast forward again to more globalism. I, I would suspect the latter is probably the case, but we're going to see a pullback now. And I think, uh, we should all be very supportive of that and how we can protect our own businesses, our own country, especially in essential services, essential products, and make sure if we're doing trade, it's, for, it's good for both sides. We've had a lot of the trading arrangements in the last 20 years have been geared really to benefit um, some of the low, low labor areas, and that's caused a lot of problem for our blue collar workers and for um, you know, manufacturing business in our own country, and we need to be concerned about those those businesses. Um, so, help, good, healthy competition, absolutely. But um, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens over the next, the longer term. Short term, I think, yes, a lot of pullback on globalism. But longer term, there's a lot of people who really want a one world government, one world economic system. Mm -hmm. During your presentation, you made reference to the modern monetary theory. And uh, just wondering if you could explain a little bit more what you mean by that. Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, in a nutshell, and of course, behind a lot of these theories, in this case, the modern mo monetary theory, there's a lot of details. So I don't want to be overly simplistic. But what I'm referring to is this idea that uh, printing money can be very advantageous and that governments really have a larger pool of wealth available to them than we've seen before. And so the idea is that governments can print wealth, print money, I should say, print uh, currency. And instead of going through the traditional route, which is through the banking system, where it gets into the banks and the banks then lend it out and it goes into the economy in a multiplier effect, you can actually drop that money and put it, send it directly to consumers, directly to the taxpayer, directly to people. And so it's, that's what they call sort of almost like a helicopter drop is you know, some of the terminology people use. And they just drop the money, send checks right to the average person. 
And this is, whether it's a universal income benefit or whether it's just providing subsidies direct to people, this goes much beyond social welfare. It actually says that we can just, if we see an area where you know, we want to enrich it, we can just drop money into it. If we do it carefully, we shouldn't be worried about inflation. We should be able to do it without in incurring a lot of inflation. And so I think this is, this is a real risk because once people start thinking you can do things like that, um, the pressure on government then to just send checks out and to support certain areas of the economy is just going to grow, grow, grow. But you cannot do that indefinitely. I mean, it, this is, there, there are limits to what you can do in any of these areas. And so we need to be concerned. I think, as I said before, this coronavirus is creating uh, a Trojan horse, if you will, for those sorts of risks where we're seeing government say, well, you know, it wasn't your fault, therefore we'll send you a check. Well, that might be the case. But what happens the next time where isn't anybody, you know, the economy is run, running along and we want to support a certain area, it's going to be easy to send checks out. But people need to work for the money. That's, that's immoral. It's immoral to give people something that they haven't earned. That's very, very wrong. And so uh, just to write checks to give them to people ultimately means you're stealing from the people who actually have created the wealth and the productive class. So um, and we have to be wary of that. That's a theory that if taken very far will destroy the productive economy. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this uh, mass printing of money and corresponding deflation uh, will cause the public to turn to cryptocurrencies which are decentralized? Well, I think, I think um, there are more and more people talking about that. And, uh, and look, I'm very sympathetic to the objective of cryptocurrencies. My concern as an investment person is it's virtually impossible to value them. And I don't think the government will allow a currency to be used in an extensive manner. Um, and so over time, uh, I think the, the government will clamp down on all cryptocurrencies. They want their own digital currency. They, don't, look, they do not want someone controlling the buying and selling in a medium of exchange that's outside of their control. So um, will, it, uh, will it attune people to the issue of uh, our fiat currency being worth less and less? Absolutely. Would it normally encourage more cryptocurrencies? I think absolutely. Um, will the government step in and, uh, and hinder that? I think absolutely. Um, so there's gonna be some tension here because I think people, there's more and more investors, more and more Canadians, citizens are seeing that their money is less trustworthy. And so they're trying to come up with alternatives, efficient, effective alternatives. And I'm sympathetic to that. But uh, I think it's going to be a tough one. I mean, the government's going to be regulating and monitoring every single transaction and move that takes place um, on that. So, so, so the short answer to the question is, yes, I think it does alert people and interest people more. But this, the second part of it is beware and be careful that uh, you know, the government's going to have their hands all through it. Um, make no mistake about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question here is just... Uh, in terms of uh, you know any any levers that the government should avoid using uh, levers for recovery, um, what do you what do you perceive as some of the levers that they should avoid using? Well, I think I think a key lever would be to try to avoid at all costs nationalizing assets. We need to keep things in the private sector. So. Providing short-term loans and support would be much better uh, to businesses that have been damaged, but we don't want the government in, in the perfect world taking over assets. They're not, you know, they're not good effective managers. So that would be one issue. I think the other issue is owning up and being much more transparent about how much, how much uh, the deficits they're taking on and how much debt they're actually taking on. You know, I think if the average Canadian really had a much better sense of the hole that we're digging and what we're putting ourselves into, they'd be much more concerned about uh, where this is going. And then lastly, I'd say that as they are providing support, which I really reluctantly like to see, that support should only go to um, people who really need it. And I know it's hard to ascertain that. It's hard to get at the end, you know, to find out what companies really need it, what people really need it. But uh, we need better checks and balances. You're getting a sense that as soon as there's, there's a perceived need, um, our government's just prepared, okay, we'll send money into it. Well, we don't have that money. This is debt. You know, our prime minister says that, uh, th you know, we had a reserve fund. There's no reserve fund. You and I are the reserve fund. And so we need some honesty here. And I think the lever of just 
infinite amount of deficits and then backing it up by printing money. We, we've taken this way too far. So those are some of the things that are just should be really concerning the Canadians and, and to other countries where the same thing's happening in those countries, not just our own. The next question is, uh, is from someone who uh, believes that your, your economic analysis seems incontrovertible uh, in the, the evidence that you've presented for it. And so they have asked this, part of the, they've said, part of the problem is the overloaded public sector. In Canada, the government has a virtual monopoly on education and healthcare. You're wary of businesses involved in discretionary spending. These two are essential though. Is it a time? Is it is it time for starting a private healthcare or education entity? I would be one hundred percent behind um, more private initiatives in both the area of uh, healthcare and the medical area, and also in education. Absolutely, good healthy competition. Now, in the in, people have to remember that when it comes to the healthcare sector or the um, you know when you look at all of the different health professions. So many of them are already private. I mean, you look at dentists and chiropractors and uh, autometrists and so forth. I mean, there's a tremendous private sector that thrives. The public part has really been the medical area, and even there, there's 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 uh, private parts. I think that given if you just look at the situation in Ontario, we can't afford to continue to provide the services at a high level to an aging population right now. I mean, we're already over capacity. And so we're going to need, I believe, to bring in private monies to help alleviate some of that pressure so that we can actually look after everybody in Ontario properly. Not to create you know, a two-tiered system, but we need to bring in more capital and that's got to come ultimately from the private sector. So I believe very strongly that would be a wonderful addition and add a lot of value to our medical system, number one. Number two, in terms of education, absolutely it should be more competitive. We should be able to have a much more vibrant private uh, system and school system that gets tax credits and um, doesn't have to be supported directly by the government, but parents that send their children there should not be penalized. Um, I have four children. I have not used any of the public school system in this country um, other than uh, universities or colleges and above. And uh, yet I've had to pay, multi you know, I have a couple of properties. I've paid multiple property tax. I pay for the school system. I disagree with the system in many regards. I don't think it's a quality system. And yet um, there it is. And so we need a much healthier competition. The best way to shake things up is competition. It's amazing how that works. And uh, I mean, we have much to be thankful for, but we can make it far better. And I think those are two areas where a little, uh, more, more competition added to the pot in both areas would be a great addition to our country and to our province. Mm -hmm. uh, human inventiveness and adaptation, uh, some of which you've been referring to even as we've been discussing here, uh, is our greatest strength in economic recovery, this person writes. What role can governments play in stimulating much needed innovation? Get out of the way. <laughs> if you allow people and give them the, the opportunities and take you know, unnecessary regulations and burdensome taxation and so forth, and just let people's ideas flow, this is the beauty of an economic system with maximum amount of freedom. People, I mean, God's created so many gifts and abilities in people and so many um, opportunities that they will create. And so I just say the biggest thing government can do is get out of the way. The government does not create wealth. The government, uh, if anything, can distort um, the levels of wealth in society and cause greater problems. So look, we need government. There's some key functions for government, but when they overstep, that's, the, that's a big problem. And so the biggest thing government can do is let the innovation go. Let people think. Let people create new businesses and get their, you know, take their foot off of them. And um, as I said, also in my presentation, keep taxes lower on small businesses and watch the regulations and let them flourish. This is where, you know, a lot of the key research, development, new products, innovation takes place with small companies, and then the big guys go and buy them out. But we need that dynamic sector where there's a profit opportunity and people can really thrive and, and maximize the gifts and abilities God's given them. And, uh, and so that's what I would say there, government, get out of the way. <laughs> um, 
Final couple of questions here. So the the second last one is uh, with respect to the family unit. So just a question about could if you could elaborate a little bit on the link that you see between self sufficiency and the family unit. Yeah, the family unit as created by God and relayed to us very clearly in the biblical text is essential for social cohesion. A mother and father raising a uh, devoted to raising a family is irreplaceable. There is no culture and no society that survives long-term with a family unit that's in disarray. And so when we speak of the family unit, I'm speaking about the biblical model. I'm speaking about a family, a loving family that's devoted to raising of children, of creating an environment where they show proper leadership, role models, they teach ethics and virtues and character building. They take their children to church and they teach them what's right and what's wrong. On, on, uh, from a biblical perspective, a family unit that's loving, caring, unconditional love, that is ultimately going to build the citizens that are absolutely self-sufficient, that can go out. And I don't mean self-sufficient like they're little autonomous, but they can work with other people and they don't need a big overreaching government to tell them what to do, that they're confident because they operate ultimately in God's world and they feel comfortable in him and, you know, and the government doesn't replace um, they're, you know, replace God. Those are the types of people that we need. And if you look at all the studies, it's quite interesting. The fastest way to eradicate uh, poverty is a strong family unit and a strong marriage. And all the stats, I mean, all the stats show this. I mean, it's not like I'm telling people what, you know, they don't know. If you want to look at the problems in any of our inner cities and our, you know, issues, it's fatherlessness. No fathers, no role models, no leadership, no ethical and moral instruction. So absolutely, the link between a prosperous and vibrant and economy and self-sufficiency where there isn't this panic and dependence um, on government is going to be definitely a strong nuclear family. It is absolutely irreplaceable. And so to see the government attack or at least undermine our families um, on so many levels um, is ultimately one of the most dangerous things uh, that we can see in terms of our economy. What we should be doing is promoting strong, healthy families, loving families. I mean, I know the family I was raised in, I wouldn't be the person I, I am today if it wasn't for my mother and father and for the instruction and for the discipline and the love that they bestowed upon myself and my three other brothers. Um, and now I, I really act to my own children. So um, I cannot overestimate. I mean, I made that one statement in the presentation, but behind that statement, you could do presentation after presentation on the importance of the family unit. It is irreplaceable in a society, a free society, and uh, one that uh, it can you, know, you learn self-government first. Um, otherwise, you know you can't you can't you cannot have a free and prosperous country. Mm -hmm. It certainly plays a uh, uh, well the most significant role I would say in in forming an individual. And if people haven't been brought up in strong families then the, the, the point there is we show care and compassion and show them the right way. They need to see other models that work. And, uh, and so um, my, I, my own father was raised in an orphanage. He, both his parents were died when he was quite young. And yet he had tremendous role models. And most importantly, he had the Bible. The Bible told him what a husband should be like and what a father should be like and so forth, right? And so just because there are weak role models, unfortunately, that's the world we live in, then we should be promoting strong role models and examples for children that are in, brought up in difficult circumstances. And that would have more impact on them than almost anything. Well, the last question for you, Jonathan, is uh, maybe just to, uh, just to bring it down to a very practical first few steps um, to move from park to first gear towards restoration economically. Um, what uh, what are what are what's your vision of a safe protocol and just those first few steps? What would those be? Well, let me just say a couple, very quickly. There's been a number of um, very helpful protocols that have been put out. And I think some of the things that the governments are talking about are provincial governments. We've seen state governments, and even if, uh, I've seen some some of the politicians have put out even in Canada very helpful. And I think it starts with the first of all. Um, you know, just cleanliness and practices. There's many things that we can do to be, to protect ourselves in cleanliness, building our own immune system, 
um, changing some of the ways that we do things so that we're making sure we're not open and vulnerable to not just this flu bug, but bugs in general and catching things um, and, and trusting other people. And I think one of the things that disturbs me with some of the things that have happened is that the governments tend to think of their citizens as children that they can't trust. I think, look, Canadians are smarter than that. We need to be trusted with our health. We need to be trusted with new protocols like washing and cleaning and being careful of uh, you know the different things that we're doing. Um, you know how in, in close quarters, making sure again that we're using cleanly, cleanliness practices and so forth. And so I think those are the those are some of the very you know easy things that we can do. I mean I don't know about you. Whenever I got on a plane long before the coronavirus. My wife would always have, and I'd bring Lysol wipes, and I'd clean off the seats, and I was cleaning things long before this, because I knew they weren't clean, and I was sitting down on them. I didn't know what the person had before. So there's, there's those basic things. And then I think it gets into how do we protect truly vulnerable people? This whole quarantine has been about protecting you know, people who actually aren't that vulnerable. Let's protect the most vulnerable. Let's put circles around them. Let's, in our long-term care facilities, those should be completely rethought in terms of how we protect our people there. That's where well over half the deaths have been. And so how do we do a better job of looking after the most vulnerable should be much more oriented there. And, uh, and then opening up businesses, um, we should be opening up to businesses that clearly there's a lot less risk, outside business, construction businesses, um, if there are essential services where people can still work at home but not interfere with the product, productive aspect of the business, we can do a bit more of that going forward. We don't have to be crawling and piling in on top of each other. So there's a whole way to step this up, but we need to open it up as quickly as possible. Let provinces decide and then let localities decide and put the ball back in the businesses also. And so it's not just totally top down because everyone knows their circumstances much better. And I think I find this somewhat um, disingenuous that somehow a couple of bureaucrats in Ottawa are gonna tell us how to operate all our businesses. Well, we can put in play in our own business what we need to do. I was talking to a fellow, a business here in Burlington where they uh, have a men's shop and they're of course close. And he said, you know, Jonathan, we're already thinking through all of the things that we're gonna do in our business to make it safer for our clients. That's what we need to do. And so, and trust each other. Um, I think this is, trust has really been broken down. We need to, as a country, as a society, as a community, build trust in each other again, which we had in the past. And we're gonna have to re, you know, reinvigorate that. So those are just some of the ideas, but there's some great ideas floating around in terms of really detailed protocols that people are coming up with. And, uh, and uh, I don't want to, you know, there's, there's details that um, I can't go into here in terms of those. But those are just some preliminary ideas and things that we can do to make a big, big difference um, going forward. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. Thanks for, thanks for your transparency and just uh, straightforward uh, shooting with us as well as we uh, just kind of go back and forth and hear, hear different responses that you have to all these questions as they've come out. Greatly appreciate your, uh, your willingness to engage on this level. Thank you very much, Steve. It was wonderful to be able to talk to all the participants and uh, I wish them all the very best and, uh, and, a, and a prosperous future here as we get things going and back, back in order, uh, Lord willing. Absolutely. Well, thanks all of you for watching today and uh, we hope that this is, uh, this, uh, both the webinars as well as the question and answer time with Jonathan here has stimulated some great thought for you.